In 2020, I went to study in Lithuania after living my whole life in Ukraine. And in light of recent developments, I had to realize that Lithuanian history is actually pretty cool. Baltic people traded amber with Romans and fought Vikings. The name Lituwa was first referenced by a German priest in 1009 of the current era. Lithuanians were the only ones in the Baltic region who were never conquered by the Crusaders and, with the help of Poland, defeated the Teutonic Order in the famous Grunewald or Zalgiris battle of 1385. 72 streets in Lithuania are named after that accomplishment. And here's a sumushtinis from a local grocery chain, which is named after the most decorated Lithuanian basketball club, which was in turn named after the battle. Not the most confusing nameception, but if you missed the visual aid, take 1d4 of psychic damage. Anyway, what I really wanted to explore is the historical context of why Lithuania is so eager to help Ukraine in its struggle against Russia. Lithuania's conflicts with Moscow date back to at least early 14th century. But the first time they really got the taste of the Russian menace was in 1492, when the Grand Duchy of Moscow under the first Russian Tsar Ivan the Great initiated a series of wars to recover the formerly orthodox ruled lands from the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. As a result, by 1503 Lithuania had to give up almost a third of their territories to Moscow and massively up their reliance on Poland, which is a factor that has led to the creation of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It's interesting to note that by the 17th century the Commonwealth was weakened and lost a series of wars, in part due to their unique political system of nobles' democracy, where a consensus was a prerequisite for any important decision. So basically they were losing their ground due to them being not authoritarian enough for their time, which is tragic of course, but it makes them look based. In 1795 the Commonwealth ceased to exist and Lithuania was split 9 to 1 between the Russian Empire and Prussia. Russia didn't allow any separate recognition and in 1812 many Lithuanians even joined Napoleon's invasion of Russia in hopes of achieving liberty, but they were doomed to fail. Lithuanians and Poles revolted against the Empire twice, in 1830 and 1863. The so-called November Uprising aka Cadet Revolution of 1830-31 was an armed rebellion that was launched in Warsaw by young Polish military academy officers. It was provoked, among other things, by Russia's complete disregard for the Polish constitution, censorship and plans to use the Polish army to suppress revolutions in France and Belgium. The Tsarist government feared the uprising would go from Poland to Lithuania, so they imposed martial law, restricted contacts with Poland, arrested political dissidents and started weapon confiscations. Despite that, Lithuanians joined the uprising in March of 1831. An honorable mention goes to Countess Emilia Plater, a highly educated person who admired the ideas of romanticism and the activities of Philomaths, who is often referred to as the Lithuanian Joan of Arc. At the beginning of the uprising, together with her cousin, she mobilized the rebels in the Dusetas region, leading a platoon of several hundred soldiers. She herself fought in the front ranks, as, according to her words, she had hoped to go to war her entire life. Rumors about the courage of Countess Plater spread throughout Lithuania. Unfortunately, she got sick and died in the field. The tombstone on her grave says, I gave my soul to God and my life to my homeland. She was 25 years old at the time of the uprising and managed to become one of the most badass women in known history. The rebels were initially successful and occupied most of Letova, but just like everyone else, they eventually were crushed by the numerically superior, well-trained and armed Russian Imperial Army. As a consequence, censorship was intensified, Lithuanians were forced to pay contributions, rebel officers were sentenced to death and many active participants were forcefully migrated deep into Russia. The Tsarist government launched a campaign to eliminate the notion of historical camaraderie between Lithuanians and Poles and to instead create a narrative that Lithuania was actually a Russian nation before the Union of Lublin. 
This, of course, was done through heavy repressions to culture and education. Vilnius educational district was abolished, many schools were closed, and censorship was tightened. The use of Russian language was adopted by governmental institutions and many Russians were appointed as officials. In 1840, statutes of Lithuania were abolished and replaced by Russian laws and courts. To try and erase even the name of Lithuania from memory, the former lands of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania were called Western Provinces. This is kind of similar to how modern Russia refuses to address Ukraine like a proper nation-state and instead refers to it like it's some insignificant borderland as part of its effort to legitimize the invasion and senseless slaughter of civilians. So, in post-November uprising Lithuania, a long-term policy of destroying historical memory and identity has been launched. However, this practice only further fueled the hostility of the local population towards the occupiers. In 1863, another uprising took place. This one was additionally caused by the dissatisfaction of basically every class in Lithuanian and Polish societies. The nobles were unhappy about the restrictions on their rights and deportations to Siberia. Members of the intelligentsia were unhappy about the suppression of culture and education, such as the Vilnius University being closed as punishment for the last uprising. Townspeople were in poverty, and peasants were so unhappy about the way in which the abolishment of serfdom was handled, they had to be suppressed with a military crackdown. Army units, of course, were constantly standing in the country. Local Catholic churches were being closed, while the new Orthodox churches were being established, and Russian colonists were brought in. Demonstrations were held in Poland and Lithuania, some even with fatalities, which didn't help either. The first one to snap was Poland, and in just 10 days they were joined by Lithuania. Provisional administration formed by a left-wing coalition promised benefits to people contributing to the rebellion. The uprising was led mainly by nobles and some priests, and in the late June, Lithuanian Provincial Executive Department was established to govern the country that was previously mostly run by peasants who aspired to get real social freedoms. Just like in 1831, rebels managed to achieve some initial victories, but were suppressed by a numerically superior occupation army in the fall of 1864. In total, 321 battles took place. The balance of power ranged between 1 to 10 and 1 to 20 in favor of Russia. During the uprising, 21,612 people were sentenced to death, labor camp imprisonment or deportation. Lithuanian press ban was put in place in 1864 and stayed in force until 1904. Under it, Lithuanian language publications printed in Latin alphabet were banned, and instead Cyrillic ones were encouraged. Schools began teaching in Russian and even speaking Lithuanian was prohibited in certain cases. This was an effort to Russify Lithuania that only produced more anti-authoritarianism and Lithuanian nationalism, which was noted even by the Russian Ministry of Education in a report issued in May of 1898. Lithuanians organized underground publications and engaged in book smuggling. Even nobles who were considered trustworthy enough to not be searched at border checkpoints often engaged in this national activity, giving future generations an example of how to use your privilege for the good. During the years of the ban, 3,047 people were arrested in connection with it, and almost 4,000 illegal non-periodical publications have been produced and distributed. In 1905, the Tsarist regime made a number of concessions as a result of the First Russian Revolution. Lithuanian language returned to schools and public discourse, and Catholic churches were built, but still no real autonomy was given. Lithuania was occupied by Germany at the start of World War I, but just three years later, in 1918, it declared independence and formed a proper government. Lithuania fought a half-year war against Soviet Russia that ended in Lithuanian victory thanks to the support from German volunteers and the fact that Russians had multiple fronts to fight on. The war was concluded with the Soviet-Lithuanian Peace Treaty of July 12th in 1920, where Soviet Russia fully recognized independent Lithuania. At the beginning of World War II, the Soviet Union captured Vilnius during the invasion of Poland. 
According to the Soviet-Lithuanian Mutual Assistance Pact of 10th of October 1939, the Soviet Union transferred Vilnius and the surrounding territory to Lithuania in exchange for the stationing of 20,000 Soviet troops within the country. It was basically a sacrifice of independence. In the spring of 1940, after losing the Winter War to Finland, the salty Soviets heightened their diplomatic pressure on Lithuania and issued the Soviet ultimatum to Lithuania in June of 1940. The ultimatum demanded the formation of a new pro-Soviet government and admission of an unspecified number of Russian troops. With Soviet troops already stationed within the country, Lithuania simply could not resist and had to accept the ultimatum. A brand new pro-Soviet puppet government was formed, known as the People's Government, and elections for the so-called People's Seimas were organized. People's Seimas immediately voted to convert Lithuania into the Lithuanian Soviet Socialist Republic and petitioned to join the Soviet Union, formalizing the annexation. Hopefully I'm not the only one who sees parallels between this classic Soviet behavior and the foreign policy of modern Russian Federation. So anti-authoritarian and anti-imperialist, they can't help but act like fascist dictatorial warmongers. Immediately after the occupation, the Soviet authorities began rapid Sovietization of Lithuania. Initially, to gain support for the new regime among the poor peasants, large farms were distributed to small landowners. However, agricultural taxes were dramatically increased in an attempt to bankrupt all farmers in preparation for eventual collectivization, or to use a better term, enslavement, since farmers couldn't even receive passports until 1969 and were tied to their collective farms, unable to leave for more than 30 days, and that only with a permit from a rural council. Good job, Soviet Union. Fucking amazing. Oh, but that's not all of it. Nationalization of banks, larger enterprises and real estate resulted in disruption in production that caused massive shortages of goods. Lithuanian currency, litas, was artificially undervalued and withdrawn by spring 1941. Standards of living plummeted. All religious, cultural and political organizations were banned, leaving only the Communist Party of Lithuania and its youth branch. An estimated 12,000 enemies of the people were arrested. During the June deportation campaign of 1941, around 12,600 people, mostly former military officers, policemen, political figures, intelligentsia and their families, were deported to gulags in Siberia under the policy of elimination of national elites. That's just in Lithuania, by the way, that's not union-wide. Many deportees died due to inhumane conditions, 3,600 were imprisoned and over 1,000 were killed. While reading about this, I couldn't help but think that Soviet Union was just one bad book in Stalin's reading list away from becoming exactly like Nazi Germany. Especially if you consider how the USSR almost became an Axis ally, but Stalin got too greedy and didn't want to give up Bulgaria during the negotiation. Imagine unironically being a Marxist-Leninist today. Because I can't. On the topic of Marxism-Leninism, when the Soviets were running from the quickly approaching German forces, they also committed torture and mass murder of political prisoners, which apparently was a normal practice for the hastily retreating NKVD with bad logistics and even worse moral characters. One famous example of that happening in Lithuania is the Reine massacre, which involved the NKVD taking between 70 and 80 political prisoners on trucks to the nearby forest and, according According to the coroner's examination, subjecting them to at least a dozen different methods of torture and humiliation before actually killing all of them. Also, when I say political prisoners, I don't just mean politicians and intellectuals. There were also people guilty of things like owning a Lithuanian flag, not giving their crops to the Soviet authorities, or possessing non-communist literature. In 1942, the Soviets tried blaming this on Germans, but locals were well aware of who was actually responsible. So when the Soviets reoccupied Lithuania later, they simply suppressed discussions of the massacres. Nice. The heaviest physical losses in Lithuania during World War II were suffered between 1944 and 45, when the Red Army invaders pushed out the Nazi invaders. 1944 is also the year in which Stalin resumed his terror campaign on Lithuanian people. 
The Soviet deportations from Lithuania between 1941 and 1952 resulted in the exile of tens of thousands of families to forced settlements in the Soviet Union, especially in Siberia and other remote parts of the country. Between 1944 and 1953, nearly 120,000 people, 5% of the population, were deported, and thousands more became political prisoners. Approximately 20,000 Lithuanian partisans participated in the unsuccessful warfare against the Soviet regime in the 1940s and early 1950s. Most were killed or deported to Siberian gulags. During the years following the German surrender at the end of World War II, between 40 and 60,000 civilians and combatants perished in the context of the anti-Soviet insurgency. It's interesting to note that considerably more ethnic Lithuanians died after World War II than during it. But hey, let's just call it the people's slaughter, and now it's so much better. Lithuanian armed resistance lasted until 1953. Adolfo Adolfas Ramanauskas, the last official commander of the Union of Lithuanian Freedom Fighters and a guy with a very unfortunate first name, was arrested in October 1956 and, of course, executed in November 1957. The Soviet authorities encouraged the immigration of non-Lithuanian workers, especially Russians, as a way of integrating Lithuania into the Soviet Union and encouraging industrial development. But it didn't really go as well as they intended and instead Lithuanization of post-war Vilnius took place, since Stalin so generously gave it to Lithuanian SSR. The resettlement of Vilnius, even though under the oppressive Soviet rule, fulfilled the long-held dream of Lithuanian nationalists. Vilnius University was reopened, Lithuanian language became more well used and refined than ever before in nation's history, and the economy did well in comparison with other regions in the Soviet Union. But between the death of Stalin in 1953 and the reforms of Mikhail Gorbachev in the mid-1980s, Lithuania still suffered all the repression of a typical Soviet society. Borderline slavery under collectivist agriculture, severe punishment for criticizing the system, travel restrictions, persecution of the Catholic Church, and extensive corruption in favor of those who obediently served the system. Lithuanians and other Baltic people distrusted the Soviet regime even more than people in other regions of the USSR, so they were quite supportive of Gorbachev's program of social and political reforms known as Perestroika and Glasnost. Under the leadership of intellectuals, the reform movement of Lithuania, Sayudis, was formed in mid-1988, and it declared a program of democratic and national rights, winning nationwide popularity. Inspired by Sayudis, the Supreme Council of the Lithuanian SSR passed constitutional amendments on the supremacy of Lithuanian laws over Soviet legislation, annulled the 1940 decisions on proclaiming Lithuania a part of the Soviet Union, legalized a multi-party system, and adopted a number of other important decisions, including the return of the national state symbols. A large number of local Communist Party members also supported the idea of Sayudis, and with Sayudis' support, Algirdas Brazauskas was elected first secretary of the Central Committee of the CPL in 1988. On the 23rd of August of 1989, Latvians, Lithuanians and Estonians joined hands in a human chain that stretched 600 kilometers from Tallinn to Vilnius in order to draw the world's attention to the fate of the Baltic nations. The human chain was called the Baltic Way. In December of 1989, the Brazauskas-led Communist Party of Lithuania declared its independence from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and became a separate Social Democratic Party, renaming itself into the Democratic Labour Party of Lithuania in 1990. In early 1990, candidates backed by Sayudis won the Lithuanian parliamentary elections. On 11th of March of 1990, the Supreme Council of the Lithuanian SSR proclaimed the act of the re-establishment of the state of Lithuania. The Baltic republics were in the forefront of the struggle for independence, and Lithuania was the first of the Soviet republics to declare it. Vitautas Landsbergis, a leader of the Sayudis national movement, became the head of state, and Kazimira Prunskienia led the cabinet of ministers. Provisional fundamental laws of the state were passed. 
Soviets have soon woken up and started demanding Lithuania revoke the independence. When they were met with a cold F off, they imposed political and economic sanctions. And of course, in typical Soviet fashion, they used the military. Oh, sorry, people's military. They occupied several public buildings, but the violence was mostly contained until January 1991, when the Soviet authorities sponsored the so-called National Salvation Committee in an attempt to overthrow the elected government. Starting from January 11th, Soviet troops were already using live ammunition against civilians. On January 12th, people from all over Lithuania became encircling the main strategic buildings. The Supreme Council, the Radio and Television Committee, the Vilnius TV Tower and the main telephone exchange. 13th of January, though, is now sometimes referred to as Bloody Sunday. At night, Soviet soldiers and tanks began the assault on the Vilnius TV Tower. Soldiers were firing live ammunition overhead and into civilian crowds gathered around the building. Tanks were driving straight through the lines of citizens. 14 people were killed in the attack, most of them shot and two crushed by tanks. The TV tower was seized. However, in roughly half an hour a small TV studio from Kaunas came on air and soon, with the help from a Swedish news station, it was broadcasting to the world that Soviet soldiers and tanks were killing unarmed people in Lithuania. Following the attack, over 50,000 independent supporters gathered around the Supreme Council building. People started constructing anti-tank barricades and setting up defenses inside surrounding buildings. Provisional chapels were set up inside and outside. Members of the crowd prayed, sang and shouted pro-independent slogans. Then, miraculously, despite columns of military trucks, BMPs and tanks moving into the vicinity of the Supreme Council, Soviet military forces retreated instead of attacking. After the USSR failed to crush the independence movement, Lithuanian government continued to function. During the national referendum on the 9th of February 1991, more than 90% of those who took part in the voting, 76% of all eligible voters, voted in favor of an independent, democratic Lithuania. There was another Soviet coup attempt in August, where Soviet military troops took over several communications and other government facilities in Vilnius and other cities, but returned to their barracks when the coup failed. The Lithuanian government banned the Communist Party and ordered confiscation of its property. But hey, at least it became people's property, so that's good. Following the failed coup, Lithuania received widespread international recognition on the 6th of September 1991 and was admitted to the United Nations on the 17th of September. Happy End to be completely honest, at first I was intimidated by the vast history that Lithuania has. But the deeper I got into the research process, the more invested I became and the more the history of Lithuania's resistance against oppression grew on me. When I see through just how much Lithuanians had to go through to get here, I can't help but feel a renewed and deeper appreciation for the country that not only gave me a place to live and gave all the opportunities that helped me develop as a person, but also actively supports my native country in its struggle against fascism. I sincerely hope Ukrainians will finally put the spirit of the USSR to rest, finishing what Lithuania started over 30 years ago. Stay safe.